ours is an ancient faith, passed from generation to generation. In an ever-changing and evolving world, the core of Christian faith and belief has endured. Around the world and across the ages, amidst a variety of traditions and styles, these words unite us. I believe. This is who we are. This is the hope that binds us. This is the faith once entrusted to the saints. This is the creed. Who is Jesus? As we begin this conversation uh, rooted in the confessions of the Apostles' Creed a few weeks ago, I shared with you that it, it sets out to, to lay the boundaries, if you will, of Christian faith. It, it tells us what orthodoxy or what right belief is, what all Christians everywhere around the world and across the ages have shared in common. And it sort of follows that at the center of Christian faith is the one we call Christ, uh, who the scriptures of the New Testament, the creed, and 2,000 years of Christian tradition would say is one and the same with Jesus of Nazareth, uh, otherwise a nondescript Jewish rabbi who lived in a backwater town in a backwater province in the mighty, mighty Roman Empire. And if, if not for what grew from the religious movement that he began, everything else about Jesus seems to say he would be forgotten to history. But for 2,000 years, Jesus has captured the attention and the imagination of the world. It, so much so that quotes about Jesus are a bit of a historical who's who and not always the ones you might expect. So uh, I thought to get us going this morning as we begin to answer this question, who is Jesus, we would examine some things that have been said about Jesus over the centuries. We'll have these on the screen for you here as we'll just walk through them. Uh, the first one here it's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Jesus Christ belonged to the true race of prophets. He saw with open eye the mystery of the soul. Drawn by its severe harmony, ravished with its beauty, he lived in it and had its, his being there. Alone in all history, he estimated the greatness of man." Pretty impressive. The guy's good with words. He should be a poet or something. Uh, next up, the former president of Cuba, Fidel Castro, who said these words, I never saw a contradiction between the ideas that sustain me and the idea of that symbol of that extraordinary figure, Jesus Christ. In another time, another uh, 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 writing, he would go on to, to say, to betray the poor is to betray Christ. Okay, interesting. Let's keep going. Uh, the words from the Quran, the, the holy scriptures of, of uh, Islamic faith, has this to say, those who say that Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary, have certainly fallen into disbelief. The Messiah, son of Mary, was no more than a messenger. Many messengers had come and gone before him. Next up, we have Albert Einstein. He's a pretty smart guy. Let's see what he has to say. He says, I'm a Jew, but I'm enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers, however artful. No man can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. 
Theseus and other heroes of his type lack the authentic vitality of Jesus. That's a pretty good endorsement, isn't it? And you now can call people a phrase monger. So, you know, tuck that away in your back pocket when you need it. Next up, Napoleon Bonaparte. I know men. And I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But what foundation did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded an empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. And then, the words of Elvis... I'm not the king. Jesus Christ is the king. I'm just an entertainer. It seems Jesus has left quite the lasting impression on thinkers, philosophers, world leaders, and yes, even the king of rock and roll. With no accurate historical ideas to tell us of what Jesus uh, looked like, we, we don't have anything that points us in the direction of his actual appearance, but that has not stopped marketing from doing what marketing does. Jesus has been screen printed on everything you can imagine, from t-shirts to lunchboxes. He's been turned into a bobblehead. I learned this week there's a Jesus transformer. That's the the panel of four there in the middle. It's a crucifix that becomes a crusading soldier, which is both fascinating and maddening at the interpretive gymnastics. Let's call it that. And it disappointed me because I have a Jesus action figure, but mine just rolls on wheels. I I don't know why he rolls on wheels, but he doesn't transform. So I'm a little disappointed. I might have to upgrade 180 bucks on Etsy if anybody's, you know, interested. Christmas is coming. Um, And then uh, Jesus as a rubber duck. This was part of a celebrity ducks line. Um, Apparently you can still find them used on on eBay if you would really like one. Um, Jesus has been called everything you can imagine. He's been referred to as Savior, as Lord, as Messiah. And a few years ago, in some perhaps ill-placed marketing made famous by some celebrities, Jesus was called my homeboy. So it seems everybody has an opinion about Jesus. And how we answer the question, who is Jesus is at the heart of what Scripture, what the creed, and what 2,000 years of Christian thought and orthodoxy will say define the Christian faith for us. As we've seen here, it's as if everyone has an opinion when it comes to Jesus, and that is nothing new. I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 16 to get us started. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to begin reading together in verse 13. If you're following along in the YouVersion app, all of the slides will will be there for you. You can follow along there in the events tab, take some notes, jot some things down. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven." This is a passage that we've looked at in some detail before together. In fact, it was a year ago today when we began our relationship together. It's hard to believe it's been a year, but in that first teaching series together of I Love Jesus' Church, this passage formed the backbone of what we saw there, and we focused on the part that comes next. When after Peter answers Jesus' question about who he says he is, Jesus would go on to say, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. 
to get us thinking today around this question about who is Jesus, though, we want to back up and zero in on what Peter, Peter's answer is, what, he in, what it entails there. Peter, when pressed on the identity of Jesus, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it sounds, at least at first, to be very familiar to what we hear in the creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Uh, but what the creed means and what we likely mean when we say that I believe in Jesus, that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is probably a little bit off of what Peter meant that day, at least in the moment. Uh, because Peter, very much living uh, the other side of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, is formed by the ideas of his day. And so when Peter says that Jesus is the Christ, he's not saying what we might think he's saying, but it, what he is saying is still vital for us to understand what it means to say that Jesus is the Son of God. It, it's easy for us to think of, of the, the word Christ as a name, but it's really not. It, it's a title. Uh, in, uh, in reality, it, it's a, uh, a translation of another word, Messiah, that means anointed one. It, it, it means for people in the Old Testament, for people in Jesus' day like Peter, it meant that Jesus in Peter's mind was the one who was to come, this long-promised Savior King. And so it's with that understanding that we have to begin to make sense of just who Jesus is. Because when Peter said those words, you are the Christ, it didn't imply that he thought Jesus was God. There was a long history of people identified as God's anointed one, whether it was simply a way to refer to the king or to a specific figure uh, that, that uh, had some significant uh, idea uh, or, or following. It's not until the resurrection, I'm sorry, let me say it again, it was not until after the resurrection that, that we began to flesh out our understanding. Up to that point, most Jewish thinking expected the Messiah to be sent by God, but no one really expected the Messiah to be God, right? The, the, God sends His anointed promised King, but nobody expected God to show up Himself, that just wasn't really on anybody's radar at the time. And so when Peter says, you are the Christ, what he means is you are God's long-promised Savior King. But he does not yet mean you are Father, or you are Son in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You guys know the song, right? All right, okay, that, that's not on Peter's map. That, that's something he's going to figure out. And, and we're going to follow that a little bit today and see where, how we get there. But in the moment, Peter saying that Jesus is the Christ has, is loaded with meaning about Jesus' role as the king. The, this long-promised Savior king who would be the rightful heir of David's throne. The one who has the authority to rule over God's people. Throughout the Old Testament, one of the ways that that king was spoken of, the rightful heir to David's throne, was the Son of God, the adopted Son of God. That's why he had the right to rule over God's people. But what we see happen in the New Testament and beyond is this. It's there in the notes. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus transformed our understanding of what it means to say that Jesus is God's Son. Okay, when, when Peter says that, he means one thing. But upon reflection of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, it transformed our understanding of what it means to say that Jesus is God's Son. It doesn't change the relationship Jesus has with the Father, okay? That is an eternal thing. It's us catching up to what has always been true. Does that make sense? It's like we were thinking about it this way, and then we look at it a different way in light of Jesus, His life, His death, His resurrection. We go, 
oh. It's one of those great aha moments. I love it. In the story of Easter, they went to the tomb. It's empty. And one of the Gospels tells us, and then they believed. And it's like, oh, the lights go on. So that's what he meant, right? Following Jesus, pursuing faith is filled with these little moments where God allows us as his people to catch up to what's always been true. Nowhere more so than in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's there, as we look at the life and the death, the resurrection of Jesus, that John's gospel begins to help us with this. Because where Matthew and Luke began their account of Jesus' life, with the birth of Jesus. Mark began his account of the life of Jesus with the baptism of Jesus. John begins his account of Jesus' life in the same place we saw the creed beginning last week, in the beginning. So let's look together here at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Starting in verse 1, we read this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Jump down to verse 10, because we're introduced briefly uh, to John, and then we get back to the, the word made flesh here in verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God. But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Okay, John hits us right out of the gate with a whole lot of stuff. And we we have to kind of scramble to catch up a little bit. He begins his account of Jesus by intentionally echoing the words of the Genesis creation account in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then we get to John 1 and it's in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and everything that was made was made through him without him nothing that has been made was made okay so he's he's taking us back to creation right we're we're backing up if we're following the the lines of the creed we're backing up to God the father almighty maker of heaven and earth right and now we're wedging our understanding of Jesus into that idea John echoes the creation account and begins to tell us about Jesus, the Word made flesh, who qualified as the Son of God in a way that no one else ever had. If we follow through the line of the Old Testament, uh, the Davidic kings, that, that promised line of heritage, had been thought of as the Son of God the adopted king ruling over God's people. Israel as a nation was thought and said to be the adopted children of God. John here in chapter 1 tells us to all who believed in the name of the one who who God sent in the name of Jesus, all who believed in him were given the right to be called sons and daughters of God. And yet John makes it clear here in chapter 1 that Jesus is the Son of God in a way that no one else has ever or will ever be qualified to be. He uses a term to describe this that uh, almost seems as if it's a favorite of John's. Uh, He uses a term here, the the one and only Son of God. If we were to to go back into the the Old English translation of the the King James, the word we find there would be begotten, 
right? That, that sounds familiar to some of us. And John uses this word here in chapter 1 to describe Jesus as the only begotten, the one and only Son of the Father. What's fascinating is when we zoom out, Luke uses this same word, but he uses it very naturally. Anytime he's talking about someone in the gospel who encounters Jesus who only has one child. We have these miracle stories of Jesus where a woman comes to him in the midst of a funeral procession and says, my one and only son has died. A synagogue ruler comes to Jesus and begs that he would come to his house and heal his one and only daughter. It seems the way that Luke uses this word is it's just the way we would use the term an only child. And you know who you are and all that comes with it. <laughs> so it's, it's like it's a normal concept. But we're going to see what John does with it because it's fascinating here. Because he's the only guy in the New Testament doing it. It's, he, 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 he takes this word and he, he kind of makes it mean something new. Following Luke, the writer of Hebrews uses this word to describe Isaac, the son of Abraham. As a testament to Abraham's faith, the writer of Hebrews says, remember what he did? He took his one and only son Isaac and offered him, ready to sacrifice him at the command of God. Does that cause anybody else to pause for a moment? What do we know about Abraham from the Genesis account? He's got another son. (laughs) In fact, he's got another son that was born before Isaac. Ishmael, born to his wife's handmaid, Hagar, because Sarah doubted that she could ever give him an heir. And yet the writer of Hebrews, when thinking about the faith of Abraham, looked at the child of promise, the true-born son of Abraham, and said he's the only one. And so we start to see this shift that's happening with this language of the one and only son. John takes this word and he just loads it with theological meaning. It seems like it's his favorite word to play with when he's talking about the relationship between Jesus and the Father. He uses it here in chapter 1 where we just saw. He uses it in the midst of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten, His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. He uses it again in the letter that we know as 1 John, to talk about the distinctive identity of who Jesus is, the one and only of the Father. So John takes this word for only child and he begins to load it down with theological meaning. To say Jesus is the Son of God in a way that no one else could be qualified to be. And what did we see about the relationship between fathers and sons last week as we talked about what it meant to say we believe in God the Father Almighty? A son is supposed to be the reflection of his father's character. The, the son should tell us something about what the father is like. And so if Jesus alone is the one and only son of God, it's there that we find what the character of God is like, what the nature of God is like. But the creed, the creed goes further still. To say, I believe in Jesus Christ, His Son, our Lord, the, the creed is pointing us in a direction that links these ideas together. He is the Christ, the Son of God. He's the rightful ruler. He's the one who has authority over God's people. Because He is the Son. And we begin to see that the 
the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus begins to transform what we mean when we say that Jesus is God's Son. It's not simply that He's the one who's appointed to be King. It's not that He's one of God's children. There's something unique about Jesus, the one and only Son. And because He is one with the Father, who is, don't forget, the Almighty Maker, it means that He is King. And the creed continues talking about the unique son, this anointed king who is one with the Father. It says, we believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And we profess in faith that Jesus is Lord. I shared with you at the beginning of this conversation, that is the earliest Christian creed that we know of in existence. Simply three words, Jesus is Lord. And what we come to see is this profession of faith that Jesus is Lord is loaded with meaning, more than we might think at first glance. And it's easy for us to miss because at its most basic, if you want to jot some things down, fill in some blanks, here you go. At its most basic, what does Lord mean? Lord means master. One to whom we owe allegiance with no competing claims. At its most basic, Lord simply means master. One to whom we owe allegiance with no competing claims. When, when the first Christians said, Jesus is Lord, that's what they meant. He's the master. We owe him our allegiance. There can be no other competing claims. It's what fuels the Apostle Paul to write about his relationship with Jesus and talk about himself as a servant, as a slave. He's in charge. He's the master. He is Lord. My allegiance is due to him and him alone. And it's what happens in the years that follow the New Testament and within the New Testament church and life of the, of the church together that, that, that loads this up with meaning because it's this belief that Jesus is Lord that sets the first Christians at odds with the world around them. It's this confession that Jesus is Lord that led many of the early believers to face a martyr's death. And it's this confession that Jesus is Lord that separated Christian faith from the Jewish roots in which it began and set it at odds with the Roman world into which it was born. And it's this simple claim that Jesus is Lord that is foundational to the shape of Christian faith. Because this idea that Jesus is Lord does a couple of things for us. The first thing it does is it, it identifies Jesus with Israel's God. Uh, what did we see last week? We, we, we saw this text in Exodus 34. Moses goes up to the mountain to receive the law, comes back down, the people are worshiping a golden calf, he throws the, 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 the tablets, they break. He goes back to the mountain, and what do we see in Exodus 34? God comes down out of the cloud and stood before Moses on the mountain and declared his name, Yahweh, Yahweh, compassionate and gracious God, abounding in love. And, and, and we go, whoa. And what we saw last week is that when we read it in the text of translation, we see God comes down out of the cloud and stands before Moses and declares his name. And what did the translation tell us? The Lord, the Lord. And if you were with us, you might remember, Lord in all capitals in the Old Testament points us to what? The divine name of God. Wherever you see that printed in, in your English Bible in all capitals, what it's telling you is behind that in the original language is the divine name of God, Yahweh. But centuries before Jesus, 
pious Jewish believers stopped using the divine name of God. It's a long, complicated process of how it, how it happens, but the short version, the kind of the, the, the Cliff Notes version, and it's not exactly accurate, but it gets us close enough that we can get our heads around it in about three seconds. Um, the, the short version is it kind of went like this. The, the, after the exile, they, they began to build what the rabbis called a fence around the law, a fence around the Torah, right? If the Torah says this is the line, we're going to say this is the line so that we don't break the Torah. Because we broke Torah and it got us shipped into exile, right? So we're just going to move those boundaries out a little bit. If, this is, if anything inside this box is okay, let's just move those boundaries out a little bit just to be safe. And so, if the commands say, don't misuse the name of God, aha, uh-huh, we can't misuse God's name if we don't use it at all. And so pronouncing the divine name drops out of common practice. The only problem with that is it's all over the Old Testament Scriptures. So what do you do? If you're reading, if you're, if, if you're reading the Scriptures aloud in worship and you come to Exodus 34 and God comes down out of, the, out of the cloud and stands before Moses on the mountain and declares His name, what do you say? And so the practice became to substitute the word Adonai, which means Lord. And so, for centuries leading up to Jesus, whenever Jews, Jew, pious Jews were reading their scriptures aloud, and they came to the divine name, there was a clue to let the reader know, say Adonai. And so that became the common practice. To, to simply substitute in spoken word the word Lord for the divine name of God. So then if we fast forward a little bit, a couple centuries before Jesus, the Hebrew scriptures get translated into the language of the day, which is the language the New Testament is written in. And this word, Lord, just gets rendered over here as Lord. Because there's not an easy way to say, this is what it says, but don't say that, say this instead, right? Does that make sense? And so the New Testament begins to use this word Lord, both in reference to God the Father, in ways like the Old Testament would. When Matthew says, an angel comes to visit Mary, and, or rather Joseph in Matthew's account, uh, what does he say? The angel of the Lord appeared to him. Well, if you look at that phrase throughout the Old Testament, you know what it says? The angel of Yahweh. That figure has a name, the the angel, the messenger of Israel's God, okay? And begins using Lord to speak in a way that is clearly a reference to the same God referenced in the Old Testament. And then also begins to use that same language, Lord, to describe Jesus. So you can begin to see how saying Jesus is Lord is kind of a theological mouthful. It's it's not just simply saying he's the boss. It's a little bit more than that. It's, It's a way that begins to identify Jesus with the God who reveals himself to Moses. His lordship is an extension of of his sonship, this oneness with the Father, which begins to mean that if I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, I pretty soon have to say that he is the almighty maker of heaven and earth, which is what John tells us, right? Through him all things were made. Without him nothing that was made has been made. And we said last week, because God is the almighty maker, it means he's the king. So when the first Christians began to say Jesus is Lord, they were saying a lot. But it was what happened when they began to live that out that got them into hot water with the Romans. Because, I don't know if you know this or not, Rome already had a king. In fact, Rome had an emperor, 
and, and his title was Caesar. And Rome thought highly of their king. In fact, if we, if we were to take time to survey some of the inscriptions to the Roman emperor scattered across the ancient world, we would see that Caesar gets called all sorts of things. Now, if you look at the graffiti, some of them aren't positive, but the official inscriptions are very, very lofty indeed. Things like, Caesar is a son of the gods. Things like, Caesar, savior and protector of the world. And yes, on multiple occasions, inscriptions simply say, Caesar is Lord. And as time went on, and the importance of worshiping the empire increased for the Roman Empire, so too did the conflict between the Roman Empire and the faith of the first generation of Jesus' followers. Because they began defining the world by two different kings. And so, to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, is more than theological niceties. The first Christians said it to declare a practical reality. Jesus is Lord. And so to Him alone will we offer worship. To Him alone will we offer praise. We're, we're not going to muddy the waters with Caesar's complete, competing claims to our allegiance. Some have wondered, some have asked at various times, why don't we make more about days like Mother's Day, Father's Day? Why don't we carve out some, some time in worship to have a patriotic celebration around the 4th of July? It's not because those things are bad. It's an intentional decision to say, Jesus is Lord. And so in this space, in these moments that we come together as the people of God, it's all His. It's all about Him. It's not to diminish the other things. It's to elevate the one true King. It's there in the notes for you. To say that Jesus is Lord is to simultaneously declare that He is one with Israel's God, Yahweh. And that since He is Lord, no one else can be. When we profess the faith that has been passed to us throughout the generations, when we say that Jesus is Lord, we are simultaneously declaring that He is one with God, the God of Israel and that since He is Lord, no one else can be. And so what that means for us is this question, who is Jesus, becomes the definitive identifier of Christian faith. And if Jesus is anything less than the divine Son, one with the Father, if Jesus is anything less than Lord and Master, the one to whom we give our highest allegiance with no competing claims, then we have something less than Christian faith. I invite the band to come back. It sounds pretty straightforward. I'm a Christian, so I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Yeah, that checks out. The practical implication is far deeper. Can I share something with you that might scratch just a little bit? If it scratches a lot, let's talk about it, okay? The lesser Lord's competing for our allegiance may have changed. But saying Jesus is Lord and really meaning it will still set us at odds 
with the world around us. Now, before you hear in that some sort of culture war kind of nonsense about, ah, it's us against the world, let's fight. No. If we are set at odds with the world, how do we respond to those with whom we are at odds with? I think scripture would say we respond as a reflection of the character of our Father who steps down from the clouds and stands before Moses on the mountain and says, I'm a compassionate and gracious God, bounding in love and faithfulness. I think it means we, we would reflect the character of our Lord Jesus who when he told us to be like our father, said, you've heard it said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and those who would do you harm. It's easy for us to hear that, that Jesus is Lord, sets us at odds with the world, and we get this, this warrior kind of mindset, all right, yeah, let's fight. But somewhere between the culture wars on the one hand and the other extreme of just leveling the field and saying, well, following Jesus, well, that's really just one option among many. You pay your money, make your choice. You do you, boo. It's fine. It's all good. Somewhere between those extremes is the creedal confession that Jesus is Lord. And like the first generation of Jesus' followers, here, here's what might scratch. That will set us apart from other faiths, even some that would make high claims about Jesus. And it will set us at odds with Caesar, no matter what party is after his name on election day. The challenge of the creed is to invite us not to trade the kingship of Jesus for allegiance to some lesser Lord. Because if Jesus is one with the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, if Jesus is king it means that Jesus must be Lord and if Jesus is Lord it means that Caesar is not if Jesus is Lord it means America is not if Jesus is Lord it means tolerance is not it means sexuality is not it means the pursuit of money is not. It means the rights we hold so dear are not. To say that Jesus is Lord is to say with believers across the ages and around the world, I believe in God the Father Almighty, who is the maker of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his one and only Son, our Lord will give no allegiance to anybody. Let's pray together.